It's another edition of Unpublic. Today is the Freedom Friday edition. It's Freedom Friday, and you are still not free, but hopefully you will be freer at the end of this hour uh, with us in this discussion than you are right now. Today we're going to talk about um, the importance of adults in the lives of children. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that got me thinking about this was... Um, spending a little time this week looking at the Search Institute's 40 developmental assets, the 40 developmental assets that are uh, needed for young people to grow up to be healthy adults. One of them is the need for support from uh, friends, family, community. Um, but I, f I found one bullet point in one of them interesting, and uh, that bullet point was that um, children need support from adults beyond parents. So mm. you definitely need your parents to be in your corner and, and providing positive supports. But beyond that, you need a community of adults outside of them also reinforcing some of your best values and beliefs and also showing you what's possible uh, in the world. So we wanted to talk a little bit today around this notion of uh, this cliche of uh, it takes a village, mm -hmm. um, you know, and it's an old African proverb. I think we made it into a cliche. <laughs> I thought like Hillary Clinton uh, started that. See, that's what no. she, you already starting problems this morning. Sharif already starting problems in the morning. That wasn't her. That wasn't you her quote. Wasn't we her. misattributed. <laughs> uh, and, and you know, it's funny because uh, for a certain group of people, that that may have been the first time that you heard, heard it. it. Yeah, yeah. Which is kind of my point is that now it takes a village is a... Um, is a cliche mm -hmm. and it doesn't mean anything anymore so it's nice to have discussions like this to get back to what specifically do we mean when we say that young people need positive adults in their lives beyond their parents and even beyond some of our common conceptions of mentorship right like yeah. you don't have to if you're listening to this or watching this or whatnot to be able to step up for young people you don't have to join a program. You don't have to go to college. You don't have to do anything specific rather than make a commitment to yourself that with each interaction you have with young people that you're going to contribute something into their spirit, something worthwhile uh, in the moment. So, um, Sharif, I want to bring you on in, brother. Good morning uh, hey, to good you. good morning. Good morning. Um, this topic uh, um, around adults stepping up. If we had a mass movement around children, for instance, and adults started deciding that they could play a part, even if they're not a teacher or a yeah. parent yeah. or your, your kid's parent, um, um, does it sound like a solid uh, um, topic and thing to be talking about with the public for you? Does it seem doable that people would want to participate? I mean, you know, when we're... You're frequently talking about like, you know, what are some solution, concrete solutions like for us, not just to, you know, um, you know, get paralysis, you know, from analysis and and not leave, you know, people with solutions. But, you know, having this idea of, of mentorship, having this idea of community, this, you know, and I think it all, all this stuff goes back to the Nguza Saba, man, you know, this collective work and responsibility, like I, I think that is a concrete a thing that can be had in our communities on a daily basis, you know, each one, reach one, each one, teach one, each one, you know, you connect with, by, with a thousand by the end of, by the end of it, if, if you keep doing this. And I know just in my, in my life and so many other folks, you know, uh, it's rare that you hear people when they say, you know, not talk about some kind of mentorship that they had. You know, and even as an educator, I used to always say, man, I feel like I'm the most mentored person in town. Uh, because of the people who would just, you know, wrap their arms around me and, and give me support, you know, uh, push me in the right direction, challenge my thinking. And I'm not alone in that. I'm, you know, so many people can talk about the mentors that they had. You know, obviously the parents are like crucial, uh, you know, uh, if you had to choose one singular factor. But then there are other components, uh, you know, that, that we can surround our families with and we can surround ourselves, you know, to them that's that can just be vital. Like, and I, th I think it's underplayed too. I, I agree with you. It's a cliche. Oh, every, you know, like every other sentence someone's saying, you know, it takes a village if, even if they're not necessarily implementing uh, the ideals of that, you know? Well, you know, I think it's interesting that if we have collective responsibility um, for our children, 
as something that we lift up as a goal. Like this is, mm -hmm. uh, we're going to talk this year, for instance, more about collective responsibility for children, yeah. meaning uh, you're not on your own as a parent. Mm -hmm. um, you shouldn't be on your own. Um, we're not going to just talk about the problem or just talk about the programs or talk about the money that we don't have. Talk about the schools, how bad they are. Mm -hmm. um, it would be possible to do all that talking and never do anything positive in the life of a young person. Um, I would, you know, uh, be first to put myself out there and say I could do more in, mm -hmm. in that area. And in the past, I have. Um, um, but we don't have, I think, a model of movements that we talk about often. I know Kenya Bradshaw um, brought up in a conversation once we were working on something mm -hmm. about how Cuba had uh, decided that they had a huge literacy problem and that they weren't they weren't going to have enough teachers to catch up to the problem. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so they basically deputized um, practitioners and sent them out into the countryside to teach people how to read. So they basically uh, had yes. citizens teaching citizens. Right. Yes. Uh, and it was a movement and they raised their literacy. That's a tangible, um, actionable thing that mm -hmm. went beyond just saying, oh, it takes a village. Now, imagine um, um, who's my dude in Cuba? Um, Castro. Castro. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just giving speeches. Well, it takes, you know, you know, y'all, we can't read, but it takes a it takes a village. Mm. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know. What I got that rhymes with village. Let me let me see. <laughs> village, village. Let, let, let's let's figure it, it out. It takes a know? village and, and let's pillage illiteracy, <laughs> right? Um, but no, it was more actionable than that. It was when I say oftentimes. Uh, um, in these discussions that we have professionalized average people out of the educational equation. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of true. We think teachers teach, principals do the leadership, school districts and schools do, you know, the education and call us when you need us, right? Mm -hmm. um, that Castro model kind of turns that on the head. Yeah, It basically says, no, 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 no. You can actually teach to read uh, um, too. Mm -hmm. I don't think we I could do that, that as a nation, but um, could you see us doing that as a city in cities or in smaller doses? Oh, absolutely. You know, I, I think our, our whole premise, uh, you know, with with the Freedom School movement is is really that like it, there's no reason why a ninth grader can't tutor uh, a first grader in, in reading. There's there's no, you know. Unless the ninth grader didn't receive the literacy support they needed, you know, uh, in say, the beginning. Yep. Uh, but if it's if it's, you know, uh, a ninth grader that that, uh, you know, is academically, you know, doing fine, even if they're a little bit behind, they can still, you know, that whole idea lift as you climb. You're you're getting better and you're supporting your youth like that's, you know, that's the, the whole premise of you know, this intergenerational model that we're trying to, uh, you know, to work with that, you know, what you can, you can tutor your, the first grader and not just your own sibling. It could be your neighbor. It could be a community member. And there, there's some basic, you know, skills, literacy skills that I think, you know, if we said, Hey, this is our, you know, one of our most important things. If we look at whatever, you know, it's across the country, but any city, any, any place we see that, that youth are, are behind adults are behind you know for all that matter uh you know in literacy and that could be a singular rallying point that everyone can coalesce band together and and make it a priority like it, there's no there's no reason why we can do it and when you talk about like cuba that reminds me like in iran growing up like literacy was like you know absolutely one of their uh you know one of their things i, I read at one point that you know uh literacy and and the sciences you know were so important to them that now like per capita you know this country iran has you know some of the largest numbers of doctors per capita in the mm. world right like mm -hmm. and this is mm -hmm. this is with sanctions this is with revolution this is with war despite all of that they're like oh no you you got to be able to uh, read and you got to be able to uh you know do this and I, I remember when we were younger they were um they had like kind of this uh uh, what do they call it here where you fill out the selection thing, but even if they don't draft you, you got to fill it out. Oh yeah. Um, I know like when you turn about. 18, right? So they yeah, have like something like that, but you have like three options, you know, and, and they're not the only country that do this, but you know, one, you can join the service Two, you're in school 
you know, um, yourself. Or three, you can uh, teach someone how to read. Mm, wow. Yeah, you can go because they, you know, like a lot of places like they're rural is rural. Like you can be in the middle of like absolutely <laughs> nowhere where yeah. they're literally, you know, uh, not schools around. And you have some, you know, folks who are like literally are shepherds. You know, they, they have they have sheep um, and they're just, you know, going place to place. Like you can go deep into some of those villages and teach folks how to read because they look at that as your service to your country, teaching citizens who aren't close to schools and they're like we can't build a school right here there's literally nobody else around here mm -hmm. but you can go and be the personal tutor and stay there a couple of years and and teach the the people in that village how to read like that's how they look at at service one of the ways they look at service and you know why why can't we do that in our communities you know with all the masjids and churches and um you know rec center sometimes you know uh mm -hmm. boys and girls clubs boys and girls like yeah mm -hmm. like yeah. but don't just say hey come come you know be the gym teacher that used to be at the school i first started teaching that he would sit down read the paper throw out a ball throw out the jump ropes and say don't bother me to the bell rings you know like we have that in our rec centers too like mm -hmm. why not um show them hey here's how you teach how to read and i think anybody who gets any money from the government Big Brothers, Big Sisters Club, you know, uh, all of those kind of things. Part of their program should be basic phonics and literacy support. Like that's the basics. Yeah. I wonder if we could build on something like the Head Start model, which mm -hmm. um, I, I never know who's in my audience. So when I say good things about Head Start, there are people that have worked with Head Start and been in the um, been in that system and worked with them who mm -hmm. understand what I'm talking about and see that's good about it. There are other people that actually uh, um, are negative about Head Start. But one of the things that I love about them is the um, bringing the community and bringing parents into the equation mm -hmm. of teaching your young person. You, you have a little <laughs> baby here and you have a young person and, and you, you are absolutely 110% qualified um, to participate more so. It's like a demand of the program, right? Mm -hmm. Like, um, and I've seen in the times that I've uh, watched and participated, um, people just own their power once they, they get in there and they know they have something to offer. Yeah. Right. Like, cause it, yeah. it's a different mindset than like, give us your kid and shut up. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, mm -hmm. it's a, it's a, um, I wonder what we could do to increase people's sense of collective responsibility for our kids. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think, you know, one of the things and, and, you know, we talk about this a lot in different circles that I'm in. You know, there was a there was a point where the common enemy got lost. Right. Like where before it was like racism was like so in your face and you were so like just, you know, uh, needed your your neighbors, your community to to try to try to help limp through life, you know, in so many different ways. It was it was the community. You hear all the stories, you know, maybe not uh, our generation, but, you know, maybe a little bit older um, where they talk about like, you know, the neighbors and this where now there's a culture like don't say nothing to my kid. <laughs> don't look at my kid. You know, even if I don't care what they're doing, you know, come find me. Even if you can't find me, don't say nothing. Uh, you know, like some of that has creeped in. But, you know, there's there's a, a an opposing force just around like this love. Right. I think that piece comes from the lack of trust or, or you know, that's been undermining. Right. And then people start turning on each other. Uh, but I, I think this, uh, you know, the love that that communities can have for each other, just looking out and you see it, you see it in, in barbershops, you see it on sports teams, you see it in after school programming. Right. Like some of the kids will come to, you know come to school and love what's happening after school in the building. Um, you know, and I, I think that's, you know, I think that's part of it. By the time I got to high school, I was disillusioned with the whole, like, oh, this is school thing. Like, I just didn't see the the relevancy. But, you know, coaches were like, hey, you you got to be marked present in order to practice. <laughs> you know, you, you can't play if you miss. So that was, you know, for us, it was like, hey, you know what? We, we ain't trying to miss the game. You know, we ain't trying to miss the meet. We want to be able to compete. Right. And so whatever it is that we can, you know, latch on to. But I think some of it is modeling, man. Like I remember when uh, Dr. Ayla Stanford was in medical school um, and she needed some additional funds. I was broke. I couldn't give give her a dime. I'm like, you, you know, you're by peer. Like I, I have nothing to offer. But, uh, you know, I saw the community rally around and and 
made sure that that semester's tuition was paid. Right. And now we see her, you know, she was on the uh, three times dope podcast with a couple of other medical doctors. I'm sure the, the other two would also be able to say like, hey, my community rallied around me in my time and needed. Now I'm giving. So now what is she doing? She's out doing the, you know, Black Philly COVID, uh, you know, response in a huge way. And but I remember when the community rallied around her when she was in need. Right. And so mm -hmm. modeling that for me, even when I was uh, penniless, I couldn't necessarily offer my friend uh, that, you know, besides encouragement at that time. But I saw the elders of the village and what they did. Right. And so then we try to play that forward. Right. We see her doing it. You know, we see other folks in the, in, in the community doing it. So I think modeling it is a, a real, really big way and doing it in a way like, you know, not being, uh, you know, you know, sit down. Yeah, yeah. You know, like like, you know, sometimes there's a saying in, in uh, Islam where it says give. So, you know, with your right hand. So your left hand doesn't even know. Right. And so you're not being, um, you know, a braggart about it and sometimes it is important to let people know so that you can model and show the way right mm -hmm. and so it's just you know back to that intention like why are you helping um and what do you see the end goal is um and if it's community you know development and support that's a that's a noble thing it's an important thing i hope it's part of your self-concept to give um and specifically i think a show like this is just calling people to remember to give to young people like yeah. even if they're not your immediate uh young people but uh, i want to say maybe 12 13 14 years ago i i met um someone working at um at um uh, uh, thrivent financial for lutherans who is just one of the most kind of he was the best model i had ever seen of somebody who just gives 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 as part of his life it was like mm -hmm. part of his self-constitution mm -hmm. it's very much part of the lutheran um lifestyle so if you're following the lutheran lifestyle you're supposed to save give and and um spend right like that's their mm -hmm. money uh way they handle money and he said to me like chris you know i've made a dis uh, i've made a commitment to myself to at any given time have a set like a portfolio of younger people in my mm -hmm. life and by younger i think he was thinking like you know 10 uh years younger like not that far behind where he was right. Who I'm just going to feed opportunities to. I'm going to remember them. I'm going to know what they need, and I'm going to send them opportunities left and right. That's just what I'm going to do, right? Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking, damn. First of all, that doesn't take a lot of money, and I mm -hmm. loved uh, the. You know, I've learned a lot of this from the the Lutheran um, church. Is that you don't need a ton to give a ton, right? Like, there's all mm -hmm. kinds of ways you could give. It just has to be mm -hmm. part of your lifestyle, right? Yeah, lifestyle and, and, and orientation. Yeah. Yeah. And I just remember mm -hmm. thinking I could do that. Mm -hmm. Like to be a, you know, I don't need to be some big philanthropist. I don't need dollars and cents. Um, I'm looking in our, you know, in our feed and there's so many people in our comments who I look at as being talented in some way, shape or form that, um, that is different and off the beaten path. And if I was a young person, I would want to know how to do it. I look at Mama Toya, who's in our list, you know, and she, her with the, um, uh, with the crocheting crocheting yeah yeah that, I mean, she had a, a group and she didn't just teach them crocheting like it was lives they went on trips like it became a, a much bigger thing than just hey I'm, let me show you this pattern it was you know like i tried to crochet country. more than once it takes life. skills bro that's that's it not an easy skills. thing man that's, that's something you do need somebody to sit down with you with and and say this is how you do it bro, i mean but yeah. like you talk about like i appreciate <laughs> that you try like but can you <laughs> sew well like can you can you like did you used to just sew your hems or did you use one of those iron oil hems you know what i mean like which one did you do i actually um i i can't sew very well i had mm. i learned how to do hems at one point in my life Mm. with an iron needle and thread by hand mm. okay but using a machine always was like magic to me when i would see people just like run things on the machine yeah and and do it i always it was like interesting to me as a young yeah. person because it wasn't something everybody did and it just looked like i always like um loved making something mm. so i could see if i could see the finished product and I'd be like, you made that? Yeah. Then you had my interest, right? Yeah. No, that uh, was, that, I used to love watching, you know, sisters use those patterns. They would get those little packets from Sears mm -hmm. and had a pattern, <laughs> right? And then they, it was like, you know, the flimsy paper, yeah. the, the light yeah. paper. Yeah. And, then they, and then you had other folks who didn't even need that. Yeah. Like, and that would just blow my mind. They, they could just see it in their head and do it, I man. I think I remember my grandmother made me a whole ass leisure suit. Yeah. From patterns, like a whole ass leisure yeah, suit. Yeah. 
uh, mm-hmm. probably orange or green or something like that. But the idea that she made it from hand to me did it boggled my mind because mm-hmm. it looked professional, looked yeah. perfect. You it know, was, yeah, yeah. But I love that portfolio idea that you ha- that you just uh, referenced, man. Like where you have like a, a group of folks that you're saying like this is the group I'm I'm following, I'm checking in on, even if it's not like monetary, but I'm supporting, I'm finding ways like you know what it needs and and just helping you know open doors and opportunities for them. Like, I love that idea, you know, and then, and because the portfolio to me is like, not just doing, which is, you know, great just to kind of randomly do stuff as people ask, but then to be deliberate about your intention, to be organized in your, your thinking and organized. I, I love that, man. I love that. It, it, from, as a model went, it made perfect sense to me. And after mm-hmm. that, after that, it was easy for me to do because there would be people that would call me and or ask me or shoot me an email. Still to this day, I get a ton of folks who email me about something because you help me or I'm in a class and I heard you say something on a podcast. Mm-hmm. You know, would you be willing to come speak at something or whatever? Those things are so easy. Yeah. Like, yeah. But what they I don't think what they're usually ready for is for all the questions I have for them about what they're doing and what they're attempting to accomplish, mm-hmm. because I'm showing a higher level of interest then, you know, they're just like asking for a little bit of my time and they're so sheepish about it sometimes. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, you know, no, I see something like you're so bright. Like uh, um, you look through some of our young people are doing amazing things on their own already. Yeah. Yeah. That with just it, once you get them with just a few, you know, points in this direction or that direction, Mm -hmm. it'd be so much easier and better for them. Um, But you have to have that as your mindset. Yeah, yeah. That's got to be part of your mindset. What I'm hoping to do with that group um, is that when I die, they're doing the same thing so that um, my memory is a blessing beyond me, right? Like, Mm -hmm. like what they do now is it's not just for them to become better, it's for them to become better and do that for someone else, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, Yeah. Michelle Johnson says, I want to see, she says, an individualistic mindset promotes rallying around someone and giving as long as they stay behind you. Uh, The Mm -hmm. collectivist mindset wants to move people ahead, even if it means moving ahead of you. Now, this is a powerful point, um, Michelle Johnson, because I'm going to say something. I'm going to name something here. one of the breakdowns in nonprofit around mentoring people who are not that far, far behind you, like 10 years or 15 years behind you, is we have so many people that want to stay in them jobs forever. Mm-hmm. Right? They want to be 85 years not old. Not just nonprofit. Not nonprofit. <laughs> not just nonprofit. Not just nonprofit. like, you know, the youth talks about, like, yo, when are you going to pass the baton? Right? Like, and then that becomes that disillusionment. But and then nonprofits, I can imagine how it gets even like, you know, you get the founder syndrome. I did this and nobody going to do it better than me. And I, you know, like yeah. all of that. But that's ego, right? Like that's is that service or is that service really to yourself, to your ego? I think it's, you know, obviously it's ego in, in the sense that you feel identified with the role in the position, um, even as you're talking about community and you're talking about what we should do in whatever nonprofit or whatnot you're not, um, I don't know, let, let, let's change this a little bit. What if you were judged on how many young people you launched into the world to be beyond you? Like there are judges who have had law students like, come through mm-hmm. and and they can say, I can count uh, people in the federal bench and people uh, in politics and other places that all came through my office, right? Mm-hmm. It's almost like a point of pride of how many young people you launch beyond you. What if we had that as an ethic rather than, a, you know, stay in your lane? Young what person? I did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and I think it would be mutual, right? Because I, you know, sometimes I hear from both sides, you know, I hear the elder who, you know, feels like people are pushing them out and, you know, like they're like, hey, this next generation or whoever, like they're not listening. They, you know, they don't respect tradition, that right? Like, so you have that group and some young folks, they're not listening, right? Like, you know, because we all solved all Bro, the problems by while we were in don't. our teen when I, in a, while we were in our teens right like and so we're like we know all this give me the ceo ceo role right away right and so you you have some of that so i think that's why it's so important for this intergenerational um you know model and stuff and you know i i think sometimes you know when i when i think about the fellowship you know and and you know how that initially started and 
you know, as young men were reaching out to me, I was also reaching out to my peers like, hey, I got some young men. They are amazing. You know, a couple of them got their PhDs or they're working on this. Like, you know, we should come together. Right. And so seeing that kind of piece, but then watching them just do their things like, you know, it's 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 fun. It's amazing. I'm inspired. And they, I mean, it's so much smarter and focused than I was when I was their age. You know what I mean? And so. I think celebrating that, I, I think, you know, you hear this, you know, as you're describing, you hear this sometimes with uh, football coaches, right? Or, or some kind of coach like, oh, this person came through their program or this was their assistant coach. Now that person's leading that. But you brought up a, a while ago and I, was, I happened to speak to a, a math, uh, a mathematician, a black man at Iowa State who talked to very similar, brought up the same man. I can't remember his name, but he was it was almost like every uh, black math Ph.D., uh, mm -hmm. had been his student at one point. Mm -hmm. um, and I was like, man, like what a what a profound legacy. And you got some folks who trace it, you know, in the Freedom School movement, we talk about this intellectual genealogy. Who do you trace your, who taught you and who taught them and that kind of thing. Uh, but some of the folks are releasing plagues. You know, you're like, oh, now I know why you're so bad because you were in that circle. You know, that was your mm -hmm. uh, kind of forefather uh, thing, right? Like how we were talking the other day on Twitter, like who, Let's trace these uh, the capital insurgents back a little bit. Like who, who were the folks taking pictures of of you know, at their their ravaged a uh, you know a community and then taking pictures and 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 with these flags and the same kind of thing. You can almost see the 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 white mob you know uh, genealogy come through all the way through the capital, but that's been raging forever. Uh, but then you have other folks on the other side who've been just doing great work and really trying to serve uh, humanity and and their students picked up on what they what they did, what they taught. And it gets passed forward. And that's why they say great teachers are immortal, because the lessons that they teach, how they inspire, that just keeps going. That ripple doesn't stop. You know, it's really what makes the world turn. When you um, talk about in uh, in Nguza Saba, Nguza Saba mm -hmm. yeah. Talk more about that, like, because I want to get at this. I want to keep hitting at this point mm -hmm. of it is our collective responsibility for our children to do well. When I ask the question, the Maasai question, how are the children? Mm -hmm. The answer to that question is an indictment on your civilization. So if yeah. I ask you the question, how are the children? And, and you have to honestly answer. Let's say I, let's say I've got the Wonder Woman lasso on you and you have to tell the <laughs> truth. Tell the truth. And I, and I say, how are the children? And you say um, the children are well, that's a good indictment on your community. Mm -hmm. If if you say the children are not well, um, you should say it with downcast eyes. Yeah. You should say it with um, with your chest hollowed. Mm -hmm. um, you should say it with some degree of shame. So let's say collectively um, our children are not doing well. And, um, and we do that. We get past the shame part of it. Um, and we take collective responsibility. Can you say more about Nguzo Saba as yeah. a principle? Yeah. So, I mean, when we look at the the these seven principles with the Nguzo Saba, you know, the the first one is unity. It really, uh, you know, addresses this idea. Like one, you have to have you know pride in your yourself and your people to have shame, right? Like people with no pride, they won't have any shame. And so I liked how you said like answering the how. Are the children questions should bring us, you know, a deep sense of reflection if we're thinking about us as a community. Some people are they stick their chest out, man, like, oh, them young boy, they they doing this, they doing that, they killing each other, you know, all of that kind of stuff. But they say we worse also, sometimes. Yeah. Right. Like and it's, it's like it has nothing to do with me. It's all them. Right. Mm -hmm. Then when you remove yourself from, you know, the, the issues, the challenges, the community itself, then you understand like that. Too many of that is what leads us to more. And then it just keeps manifesting itself. We should look at this as a, a sacred uh, being. Some two of my favorite quotes is one is that, you know, children don't inherit the earth from us. We borrow it from them. Mm -hmm. So if things are jacked up, we borrowed it and gave it back to them in that way. And right. We're it, ruining their credit. Exactly. Old enough. Exactly. Yeah. Like yeah. we literally grew them in the soil that we polluted and then say, why are you all, you know, you know, uh, mm -hmm. misinformed and deformed and all this kind of stuff like that was your soil. You borrowed it from them and you should have returned it even better. Right. And so if we can wrap our mind around that, they don't inherit from us. We borrow it from them. That's one thing. And then the other so, one. So that let's just start oh, there, mm -hmm. though. I mm -hmm. just want to stick on this for a second. 
Yeah. So the first principle is umoja. Umoja. Uh, yeah. Uh, unity. Yeah, unity. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have that, everything else, like it's, you, it's, you won't feel a collective responsibility. If you don't think you're a collective, let's just start that. If you don't think that you're a collective, then you you definitely don't have any collective responsibility. So it this conversation's it, yeah. over. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. Keep going. So the the next one is this kujichakalia. It's uh, mm -hmm. self determination, mm -hmm. right? Like and mm -hmm. and how do, that we name ourselves, we speak for ourselves, we define ourselves, we we choose our heroes, we name our our children, we say what our educational uh, outcomes and experience should look like instead of being named and defined by others, mm -hmm. right? And so not allowing other people, you know, particularly the oppressor, you know, we, you always bring Malcolm X quote up, you know, uh, only why a, are you sending a, your, only a fool will let their fool, enemy yeah. uh, educate yeah, their children, children. Yeah. right? Yeah. And if we yeah. recognize like, you know, just, and it's always profound when you hear that and think about it, you're like, damn, like we are all foolish <laughs> in, in so many different ways, you know? It blows it's, my mind. Um, when I finally read that enough times, I thought we're the only one who does it too. Like we are the only group of people, African Americans in the United States, mm -hmm. not the only, but we are one of the primary groups of people in the United States who wake up every morning and hand our children over to a different race of people um, for their education training. And that race of people does not wake up every morning and hand their kids over to us for their training. So they're educating both their children just by sheer numbers of the fact that they run the schools, they operate the systems that run the schools, they have power over the universities that prepare the people um, to teach in those schools, and they get to determine what the policies and pedagogy and practices and what you and I have talked about in the past, what the canon will be, right? Mm -hmm. They get to decide that for their own kids and ours. And so ours. the Malcolm X quote around only a damn fool, like what I just said would not be a problem, Sharif. It would not be a problem if, if we we're said, right here, yeah, right? <laughs> but the group of people that we're handing them over to have historically always had our best interest in mind and have always been very good to us. Okay, then dope. it makes sense, mm -hmm. right? But uh, in a world where one third of American teachers voted for Donald Trump, and where they're arresting teachers left and right for going to the Capitol last week to try and overthrow the government to keep him in power. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just thinking that it's possible that maybe we need to do a better job of deciding that, number one, we're, we're, we're a collective, mm -hmm. so we should have unity. Number two, we should self-determine. So that's where you were. You were in the, in the mix on self-determination. Self-determination. Where were yeah. you taking me from there? Yeah. And so from there is Ujima, you know, uh, and that's what we started talked about early in the show, this collective work of responsibility. It is not, you know, just this individual. It is not, you know, just that person. It is how do we collectively work to as our problems, you know, not like, no, that's yours. That man, I'm going to get mine. Right. I, I think part of, you know, uh, you know, this American myth is all about individuality. And pull your own self up, and 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 when you look at when you're a student of history, and you see that white people have never pulled themselves up, they had land grants, you know, they had you know uh, free shipping, <laughs> you know, the, the, <laughs> to come shipping. over, right? Like they, yeah, yeah. like it was, it was all kind of ways uh, where they never had, but it was done under the facade of like, look westward expansion the rugged individual went and did this and did no nah, first you sent the army and massacred everybody you committed genocide that's why the land was open mm -hmm. right then you had enslaved people to come and build it off for you right but it they it's this myth of this individuality that that created this not nah, everything you did was on forced uh labor and genocide and then you you reap the the hard benefits of that, right? The stained, blood stained benefits of that. But you look at everyone else who's not given that kind of, you know, uh, you know, any kind of support. It was the exact well, opposite, right? And what you just red line and whatever is, is important for us to keep keep nail that in the ground, right? Mm -hmm. Because as much as that myth around the rugged individual who made it on their own, blah, 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 you have I just described. <laughs> well, I mean, and I get it in some ways, because number one, it's very romantic. And number two, I do believe that there's something to be said for an individual that feels very self-sufficient um, and feels free and can can do things. Like some of the, th the, the there's a double-edged sword here. Like 
when I think about my grandparents, uh, I've been thinking about them a lot this week um, because I've had three shows in which I was talking to people that had closed the belief gap and had overcome something. Mm -hmm. And I see my grandparents in that way. Mm -hmm. uh, and the thing that came up over and over again as I thought about them this week as my ancestors was how much they could do on their own. Like, like, um, did they all, all, well, no, 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 I just mean like, um, let me be specific. The skills that they have that got washed away with a generation of my dad's generation, for instance, like my grandfathers could fix small motors. They could do, they could do the electricity through an entire house. They could lay the plumbing for an entire house. They could build houses. As a mm -hmm. matter of fact, mm -hmm. my father-in-law who passed away uh, a year or so ago, um, was driving with me um, um, one day and, and sit, told me to go down this street, down that street. And we turned a corner and he pointed out a house that he built when he was 14 years old because mm -hmm. his dad made him. His dad used to lock him out, used to um, give him a set of tasks to do during the day while he was at work. Mm -hmm. And and he built a, a whole ass house. Right. <laughs> and and when he would come to our house, if anything ever was broken was or whatever. Fixed. Yeah. Um, oh my God, he would be in there like tearing apart things and then mm. putting them back together again, whatnot. Yeah. That's a level of self sufficiency and agency yeah. Yeah. that I'm okay with. But I want to stick with your point just in this way that rugged individualism mm. was also um, happening at a time where white people were legally putting into place things around unity and self determination and collective work. They were l literally defining themselves as the people who jointly owned the country, mm -hmm. jointly owned the railroads, the land, mm -hmm. the water, the streams. So they were collectivists. I mm -hmm. guess that's my long winded way yeah. of saying mm -hmm. you were being collectivists because you were doing it through law and then you were doing the yeah, but you know, I'm yeah. independent, you know, and their unity. And that's the that's the, but that's the myth and the lies that we have to make sure that our children are aware. If not, they they start absorbing, you know, internalizing the the racism and the oppression like oh well they must be they must be right look what they own like the, you know so we have to make sure no that we pull the curtain money. exactly There's right no black people have money and, and so like what are all thing? the subliminal <laughs> messages right yeah. and when and when I say like when I when I challenge them like they did that what I mean by that is not that you know because some folks are brilliant you know the stories you described the same way my father my stepfather like all you know they build something I'm just like you you know what I mean? Like you're able to right. do that. Right. Like, but uh, they also, when you talk to them, they also share, like someone shared an opportunity with them, you know, or someone, you know, taught them that thing. Then they maybe exploded after that, but you know, there's always someone that like, Oh yeah, I used to watch my father do this. Right. And so it was handed down or, you know, my father was a part, you know, would see, um, folks were building houses, you know, similar to yours. And he learned there working there as a, as a teenager. Then he got good at it. He was like, oh, no, I know. And then it started, things started clicking, right? Then he could uh, do his own thing. But I think that's important. And I think that that messaging the conversation uh, with our youth mm -hmm. to make sure they're able to connect the dots and not like, don't look at it at, on its surface and just think like, oh, you know, uh, black people, brown people, they're worth less um, because of the, the you know, without looking at it. And I would say the other piece is what we used to have is the community piece, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. um, and making sure just even the thing that's a, you know, the reason why we call our, our young next generation uh, teachers apprentices, because we started thinking about like, how did people used to do it back in the day? You had an apprentice. Mm -hmm. If you were the master drummer, you had an apprentice. If you were mm -hmm. the master uh, metallurgist, you had an apprentice, right? And so we were just like, you know what, let's have teacher apprentices. Where they're mm -hmm. learning from the best in in the field, best in the craft, and how do you you know continue to the passive you know um, passive? I do want to say on that point to anybody listening or watching who feels like mentorship is this big formal formal deal, like something that requires like <laughs> I don't know what people think it, it requires, mm -hmm. but proximity to you and seeing what you do during out the day. So, for instance, even mm -hmm. shadowing shadowing just as a uh, as a premise take you know if you take your um 14 year old cousin along with you for a day to do some things like uh, 
come on, go with me. We're gonna we're gonna go do some things. Yeah, Dre- dress up. You're gonna you're gonna sit in some meetings with me or whatnot. We're just gonna do this thing. I'm gonna take you to lunch. I'm gonna treat you like a corporate person or blah blah mm-hmm. for the day or whatnot. Um, you cannot underestimate what proximity and, and a line of sight does for young people. They are sponges. They see things. They suck things up. Uh, mm-hmm. And as long as you keep them in the dark from those things or don't show them, they don't know your method or your process or what you're doing for a living. They just even if you're successful, they don't know how you became successful. Yeah. And they don't there's know so many unwritten is, rules. So. Right. Like there's so many oh, things that's not it's not in the textbook and, and people don't verbalize. And if and if you're in a, a, a white dominated uh, industry, you know, then, you know, fine. It's not just even a white space. You hear like first generation college uh, students who right. not that's only right. are they getting a new envelope with a new bill that they've never seen. Right. The family hasn't seen it before. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, but then they go and they're like bursar's office, registrar's mm-hmm. office. Like who taught like who even, you know walks people through that right and it it ain't necessarily just happening on a tour because the tour is also they're usually speaking um their default is speaking to people who've been there before right and so if that's the environment that people are thrust in where the the common language the default conversations are you know hidden rules yeah, are assuming yeah. that, oh, yeah, you've all been here. You all know what I mean. You all know mm-hmm. what I didn't say, what I'm implying, all of that. Like, that's no. Like, that goes back to, like, the learning and making sure that you have someone who understands. And that's why that context is so important. That's why understanding the, the people that you're serving, their context, and listening to them, really getting them to talk and feeling vulnerable, right? And we're back to that mm-hmm. trust thing all over again. Because it's harder to be vulnerable if I don't trust you, if I, if I think you're going to use your new uh, information about my vulnerabilities as a weapon against me, you mm-hmm. know, to mm-hmm. judge me and, and so on and so forth. So, again, back to this mentorship and trust and um, who's pulling the coattails and, and, and what's and Maybe you have to call it something other than mentorship because this mm-hmm. is this is. No, we don't. No, we don't. I'm only making the point. The point that I want to make is not that we have to name it something different. But the point is that we have to get people away from thinking that it requires them to go sign up for a program or to do something formal or to have like some sit down when really just start exercising the muscle of demystifying the world for younger people. Demystifying. Yes. I mean, I love that. You got family members, you got cousins, you got people and you do something specific. Um, I can go down our list. I'm looking at the people on our list or whatnot that I know for a fact they do things in their lives where they had to figure out the hidden curriculum of a room. They had to figure out the the kind of like how you do a budget in, a, in an organization. Mm-hmm. Um, this came up talking to Charles Cole this week, like just, you know, nonprofit is infamous for putting people of color into roles and positions and having those people feel like imposters because you're Imposter asking them to do stuff. Yeah. yeah, you know, you've never done it before. Like, you know, someone's asking, oh, that sounds great. I love the work that you guys are doing. Can you send me a concept paper? Uh, sure. What's uh, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. like is the paper? How long, it, how long is that? Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> like, what are the components of the concept yeah. paper? What goes right. in it? You start Googling concept paper, right? And you know what? What Google turns up? Nothing doesn't mm. turn up much of anything or a hundred thousand um, pages. No. And you're like, uh, like, uh, where do I even start? Right. <laughs> right. Or there's things like, um, um, you are perfect for the role. You've been in a nonprofit for years. You're perfect for the ED role. And it comes up and it opens up and they say, you know, she is great. She's, oh my God, she knows the work so well. You know, there are just some things in some places where she wouldn't make for a strong leader. I mean, but she's great. Don't get me wrong. I mean, she could be a great number two and blah, blah, blah. I hate that situation and I'm sick of it, right? Like the idea of, okay, so you're saying she's great in every other way. Then what do you what's a, what's in your mentorship toolbox to make sure that she gets that role and gets that mm-hmm. position, right? Yeah, because it belongs to her. And now mm-hmm. it doesn't even. So let's say we do help her and she gets that role. It doesn't just belong to her. The 14 year old who sees her in her family as one of the people in the family that's doing something great and good also needs to see it too. So mm-hmm. yeah, let's help you get that role. But then let's help you over the summer go pick up your cousin or your friend's cousin or whoever and bring them in the office with you for a day, right? Yeah, yeah, I mean, and that's so important. And that whole vetting of like, we don't know if they're they're the right person, all of that, you see that so often. Um, you know, when I go around the country and people are like, oh, I need help uh, diversifying. First thing I ask for is like, who's your recruiters? Let me see. <laughs> and invariably, 
you have uh you know white women talking about we're looking for black men <laughs> you know uh just like well where exactly do you even know where to look <laughs> do you like what and then when i when i've uh I mean, the way you actually, just phrase that bro I could get you in a little trouble yeah well listen <laughs> <laughs> i guess it context right multiple yeah, scenarios yeah, there yeah. um but you know when i've uh you know when you have even recommended right and people like oh i respect your your word chris like i respect the mm -hmm. can you recommend somebody and then you know they recommend so see use it as a ceo recommend it to another ceo they pass it on to their team and then you later on you ask like hey where you know what about that person oh they they didn't make it past the phone interview you're just like wait a minute <laughs> like i you asked me for my opinion I'm giving you, uh, you say you respect me, my experience, what I've brought, people I've trained, things I've done. This person I'm telling you is, is, is so dope. And then you let a bunch of raggedy recruiters, mm -hmm. um, you know, give them the boot of the phone interview because they didn't have they didn't sound the way they're experienced uh, people sounding right with all of their biases. They weren't checked. Have you ever, you know, even looked into that? No, didn't look into that, but you trusted them with all their biases. And at the same time out there talking about, we need to be an anti-racist organization. <laughs> like, well, like all the problem is always on the anyway. outside, right? Yeah. The problem is always on the outside, not the inside. I will say this much about in that exact situation, what our role um, oftentimes uh, needs to be. So one of the ways we need to be a matchmaker, we do need to match people in our portfolio. We mm -hmm. always have to have a port portfolio of young people where we're their scout. We're mm -hmm. looking for the next Vista for them. And I have mine. I've got my set and, and it's, <laughs> it's not like I won't take any more if they come to me, but, um, but preparing them for the opportunity too. Yeah. Right. Like yeah. I've had people put me up for things and say that you'd be great for this. They're going to call you. You should talk to them about it, whatnot, and not actually have me be 10, 15 minutes into it thinking to myself, oh, my God, like, what were they talking about? Yeah, what were they talking about? <laughs> Whatever. And I needed my I needed my sponsor. We don't need mentors. That's what we need. We need sponsors. Like there's mm. there's a difference between a mentor and a sponsor. There's a difference. But I needed my sponsor. You should talk about the difference to that, too, because you've said it to me before. You, you should share that. Well, you know, so um, I think sponsors are just more invested in you. Um, um, and they're willing to put more of their own uh, credit on the line for you. And because mm -hmm. of that, they're more involved in your process, right? Yeah. Like if I'm mentoring you, I'm like, you know, trying to coach you a little bit and then say, here you go, you know, go to this mm -hmm. thing or whatnot. If I'm your sponsor, it's different. I have a vested interest in your success. I am actually using my social capital um, as an investment in you. I'm giving it to you and opening the doors. And I've had people literally do this for me not from a mentorship, um, but because they had so much social capital, they could be a sponsor, which actually it's almost like co-signing on a loan in some cases. I've gotten into roles and into positions because of their credit, right? Mm -hmm. um, and because they were that invested in me um, and they saw in me like a good investment, like, oh no, this is one I would invest in. I'd put my, I'd put my social capital in line for this one. Yeah. So I sometimes with mentorship, we're setting people up for something that we think, oh, you know, you'd be great for this, but we're not real clear with them or the other people why they would be great for it. Mm -hmm. And it sets them up to fail, to yeah. lose. Yeah. So I want to keep going back, though, to um, to our um, uh, to our principles here in, in Guzu Saba, because we had stopped at um, at collective work and responsibility. So Ujima, right. uh, collective work and responsibility, which I want to say, and this is number three on the list of them, um, which I want to say for me is the one that I wanted to get to the most, because if we don't feel that sense that it is our collective work, that one, we are mm -hmm. a collective, mm -hmm. and number two, that we need to stick together, and number three, we need to determine what the world's going to look like for ourselves and for our kids, and then number four, um, you know, your success is my success. So um, I don't care if I'm like 70 years old leading a nonprofit and there's some young upstart coming up or whatnot, <laughs> some young whippersnapper. You can't whippersnapper, come in here. Uh, you know, what I did want to say about that, Sharif, was like I get the um, I get the older person, too, that doesn't want to get out the way. Mm. At the same time, um, there's young people who like show up on the job and be like, I've been here five minutes. I deserve a raise. Listen, <laughs> right? listen, listen. I got, I, I got, I got brothers like that. I got, I got sons like this. So I understand like, 
You don't want to do that? No, no, because I should really be the boss of that. Like I, like, but you didn't make that. Like <laughs> you can't anoint yourself their boss in their company, right? Like so. So talk to me a little bit about how uh, Ujama might play into um, into this this uh, collective responsibility for our youth that we're talking about. Yeah. So I, I think you know the next one um, is really around this cooperative economics. Uh, and I think it ties exactly into the first one, the unity, uh, self-determination, meaning like, you know, we determine, you know, who we're going to spend our dollars in. You know, you shared the stats before about how quickly the black dollar leaves our community and how disempowering that is. Um, you know, at one point we're saying we need more black businesses and the next minute we're bypassing them. Um, I, I think you know, when people compare the civil rights movement to a consumer rights movement uh, was often you see played out because we were, you know, do we really want to march and fight and be abused to shop at Macy's? You know, when we have a, a black store um, that in many communities were thriving, right? Like this whole misconception, again, back to the self-determination, um, you know, defining ourselves, you know, this whole misconception that, oh, black businesses were just you know, shady or broken or wrong. Like there were many black businesses that were thriving that had the community support and it was only our abandoning them uh, caused their downfall, not because they were inherently, uh, you know, bad. And and so just continuing to make sure that we are are doing that. And I think cooperative economics isn't just the monetary aspect of it. It's, it's kind of like, I like this whole idea of sponsorship, you know, um, as a higher level of mentorship as part of the cooperative economics, because I think all investment doesn't necessarily have to be monetary. You know, it could be time, you know. Um, now, you along, know. Those, along those lines, just mm -hmm. to jump in for a second, this for me would work as uh, cooperative economics, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Right, because um, first of all, education, when we say schools aren't a business, it's a lie, they are. They have contracts associated with them. They have um, they have material investment in them or whatnot. So who owns the means of educational production in your community? Mm -hmm. Who owns the main thing that educates your people? Is a is, is it's a hill to die on. It should be you. Yeah. It should yeah. be you, right? Should so let's just, yeah. let's just be, let's just be clear. If anyone's going to start a school, run a school, operate a school, determine who gets the contracts, who gets hired, who gets fired, mm -hmm. <clears throat> what you're going to teach, how you're going to teach, or whatnot, it should be right. the collective. Yeah, and the collective should be you. And this is where we get into this phony kind of argument, I think, with with unions, where they're saying like community schools and um, democratically elected uh, boards and all that stuff. What they are selling you is a form of schools and schooling in which it looks democratic, but it's owned by them still. Mm -hmm. They run the table. All of their money determines who will become a, a school board member and who won't. And once they become school board members, they'll decide what the terms of the contracts will be how long they will teach, how much they will teach, what they will teach, or all of that looks so, it's like a mirage. It's mm. like a democratic mirage in the desert. You're in an education desert, and that looks like a democratic thing that you own. Fool, you don't own that. <laughs> That's not yours. Mm. You do not own the, the means of educational production in your own um, um, communities, right? Which means if we're talking about these principles, that you're talking about right now, when you get to something like collective work and responsibility, uh, cooperative economics, um, the education piece has to be part of that. And one of our main natural assets in that has to be seen as our young people, their yeah. brains, their minds, their education, that has to be part of Ujama. Um, you can't have an economy without educated people, mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. Absolutely. You're going to you're going to pay in, in one way or the other, you know, um, having educated people. It's an or investment, ignorance. <laughs> you know, or ignorance yeah. is is way more expensive than um, than the knowledge base. Um, and so, yeah. So, like, making sure that we're sharing that and looking at as our collective uh, issue, you know, um, mm -hmm. and, then, and then we have like Nia and we, we speak about this a lot, just having a sense of purpose. You know, if you can unify a, a, a community, right? We talked before, Malcolm said, the biggest problem with our movement is we've tried to organize a sleeping people, right? It's hard to, mm. to get purpose with that. It's like, wake people up, give them the information, make sure they understand what's going on. 
um, then they're much easier. You know, Ella Baker used to talk about that as well. Like, you know, let's just we can organize when people have a, a clear sense, clear direction, that sense of purpose. Um, and I, I, th I think that just spans all of the spaces, you know, when, you know, people are talking about, you know, teaching, for example, it's not just the content, you know, part of it is, you know, this positive racial identity, this sense of purpose in life, like then get out of their way. Like they are, they, they will drive, um, they will be uh, motivated to do, you know, what they feel that they need to do. Um, you know, and they'll challenge us to give them the education that they need to to do the things that they want to do. So, um, you know, I, I think that sense of purpose goes back to, again to unity. You know, all of these are threaded within. It's hard to speak about one without the other. Um, when you talk about this, this Nia, though, and purpose, and we talk about education, what would you see as the purpose? Yeah. So the purpose is is one. Um, is this idea of liberation and, and what that means is being able to make choices when you don't have the education that you deserve when your community then is when it's compounded because your community has so many people within it that did not get the education that they deserve then they have less options they don't have choice which means that you're not truly free you know uh when when nina simone says freedom means you know being able to live without fear the fear of economic stability, you know, uh, or instability, the fear of, you know, uh, oppressive components, the fear of being controlled of, and people deciding, you know, oh, I can let you go tomorrow. Right. Like, you know, the fear of not having agency, all of those things, you know, um, at the end of the day, it ties back into that self-determination principle. If I can't determine what my life looks like and what my grandchildren's uh you know how i influence their lives that's fear that's fearful right mm -hmm, like that's mm -hmm. that's uh nothing is as even if you're not thinking about it at the moment it is in your unconsciousness and it impacts all your decisions and that's why i say we have to always be careful about being judgmental because the when you can't determine because of all the the uh life circumstances it influences your choices even if not consciously Right. And so that's why, why I think just the education piece and this collective purpose, if our purpose is to make sure that all the children in our community can read, then that's a rallying point. And then we'll, we'll make sure that that is what we are uh, unifying around and we'll hold mm -hmm. everyone collectively. We're accountable. Like we won't need anybody else to come hold us accountable with any tool of measurement. We're already doing it, you know, mm -hmm. and, that, and that's absolutely crucial. And to remind our viewers and our watchers, and you know we're we're coming closer to time, but what we are discussing is a a a way of thinking about how we show up for youth beyond our conventional sense of mentorship, mm. or beyond our consent, our you know conventional sense of um, teaching, but how each of us has a role that we can play, and that when we collectively accept our role to play in, in the lives of youth even doing something so informal as just taking what it is that you do for a living and demystifying it for a young person that's within your orbit, someone in your family or in your neighborhood who um, is a, a elastic brain around you who would soak up a lot of what you do, just showing them or mm -hmm. taking them somewhere or um, knowing for a fact that you had to demystify the world, decode the world, that you had to like figure out how to read a room or whatnot. Um, I've seen this happen too in action too, by the way, um, being in a meeting and someone comes in with their, their, um, their young family member saying, um, he or she is with me today. Like, like, and, and you don't have to wait for bring your dad, your daughter to work day, right? No, you don't have to wait, don't. right? As a matter of fact, don't do it on that day. <laughs> <laughs> like be countercultural. Yeah. Just don't do it on that day because you know what? Adults collectively should normalize being able to do that at any given time. Normalize it. Yeah. They yeah. should normalize it. It shouldn't take a special day, you know, whatnot. You should be able to say like, listen, I'm the vice president of such and such at, at such and such a company company. Uh, oh, yeah, this is uh, my cousin, uh, uh, um, Vermonte, you know, he's with me today, blah, 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 whatever, you know, and, and just have it be normal. Like, have everybody say, Oh, well, cool. Let you know, let me get 10 minutes with you. Let me show mm -hmm. you what I do type of thing. Exactly. That's a That's a different ethic. Um, talk to me. We have two more quick ones. We're um, for people listening and watching. We're actually we didn't intend to do this, but it actually works. Yeah, for ended us. up going. <laughs> for, yeah, <laughs> um, using the Nguzu, uh Saba principles too. 
um, help us understand, like as a, a compass to help us understand this responsibility we have for the young and their education. Um, talk to me about uh, Kuumba, um creativity. Yeah, I mean, the, this idea of creativity, and one, like we all acknowledge, like we are super creative um, as a people, like we we honor that. And I, I think making sure that we see that in our youth early on, um, you know, find their creativity, watch them, you know, and that comes from watching children, listening to them, seeing what their gifts are, uh, but also using creativity to address, you know, challenges. Like we don't have to, um, you know, do it the same way all the time. Like we can learn from that blueprint, honor the blueprint, you know, because much sacrifices, there are blood stains on those blueprints. Um, but then also look at the context mm -hmm. and overlay it on today's context and see where are, you know, where are the dots. It's almost like a constellation, but you just got to know how to connect it, right? And like where to see and what path, right? And so, um, but that creativity thing, I think is important. You know, when people have light in their eyes, like their creativity is on, they're thinking, they're, they're, they're connecting. There's creativity in building your portfolio. Like, okay, how do I want to support the next generation? And how do I, how do I do it? Right? Like, how do I support them at the next level? Something, you know, when people say, oh, they saw something in me that, that I didn't even see in myself. Like that's, that's the creativity lens. That's being able to imagine something. Um, for them, you imagining something even better, even when they're resistant. When I resisted, when Mama Cynthia called me and said, "Hey, I want you to go to the meeting because they're uh, recruiting black men to teach." First thing out of my mouth to Mama Cynthia was like, "Mama Cynthia, I don't want to be a teacher." And you know, she's my best friend's mother from elementary school, and I and I was thinking, I was so like, "You was going, bro. You was yeah, going." <laughs> listen, yeah. So you know, I respect. Yeah, like, yeah. all right, Mama, I'm going. But I was like, "What in the world?" I never showed any indication that I was interested in teaching. Uh, but what she later talked about was leadership. That's what she saw, you know, but I was uh, in my, I was uncreative in my thinking. I was just like, I never even said anything. I didn't play at house. I didn't play school. I didn't do any of those type of games in the schoolyard. She saw something else, right? But that was that creativity lens and that's what we owe our, our youth. And then the last mm -hmm. one is uh, Imani, faith. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. if we don't have faith in, in the creator, in our people, in our children, um, if we don't have belief in them, then uh, this is off of naught. Like, cause it, it's, it's, I'm, I'm glad it starts with unity and ends with faith, but I also think it could have been switched around, uh, you know, in some, in some way where, where you start with faith that like, I can't see what you're going to be. I may not even be around, but I'm going to sponsor you now in the moment because I believe in you, right? It is mm -hmm. believing in our children, believing that, you know, their talent um, is a blessing. And not just to that individual child, that talent is a blessing to all of us. And so we undermine ourselves when we don't believe in it. Mm. We don't believe in a child. That means we don't believe in ourselves. And that's, you know, for my final word uh, on all of this, I think that's mm -hmm. a great place for me to to land it within I started with the developmental assets from the search Institute of which mm -hmm. there are 40 developmental assets researched mm -hmm. by the search Institute that says that if you had these four 40 assets in place for a young person that they will succeed in life period mm -hmm. um, one of those is interesting because it makes your point that you just made which is communities need to see youth as resources mm -hmm. so one of the assets that that youth need are, is empowerment and part of that empowerment is seeing their worth and their value and they are resources. They can be teachers um, themselves. So that changes the, the, the way we look at them, not as empty, hollow vessels that we have to fill. Right. Sure. First of all, like someone made the comment in our comments today that it goes both ways. Like mentorship isn't just I'm smart and you're dumb and let me fill you up with a bunch of my stuff right like that's you know, a lot of people mindset but it is yeah. a lot of people's mindset and it's the wrong mindset it's not mm -hmm. creative for one it's not seeing the eternal value of our young people our young people uh, martin luther king called um young people our most precious asset um uh, the most precious asset of our race and their intellectual development to him uh, when he was asked about education was the most precious thing that we should be defending and fighting. When you think of it that way, it becomes a different premise than you're empty. You don't know enough. I'm smart. Let me let me fill you with what I know. Um, there is this this um, there is this relationship 
that goes two directions with the young person if you're honoring them and calling them a young person instead of calling them some sort of name that denotes like lesser than some sort of childish way of putting them in a box um, um, where you will learn from it. So this is my thing. When I have that portfolio of younger people that I'm feeding opportunities to whatnot, they're also feeding me a lot of information that makes me smarter and better and wiser mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. what I'm doing. Right. Yeah. And they also act as a check on me about am I being creative enough in my own work? Have mm -hmm. you ever thought about is something they will say or they oh, will yeah. say like, you know, I saw this one thing, you know, blah, blah, blah. And you will look at it and go, oh, my God, tell me more about this. Cause this <laughs> right. You know what I mean? So it's two ways. Right. Yeah, it's intergenerational. Yeah, you said that earlier in this show. It's intergenerational. Yeah. Um, I love these principles. I want to do more work applying them around this as a model, mm -hmm. like to keep coming back to this and saying, are we doing this? But the most important thing um, for me, if I if I run through them quickly, um, the principles is that we do have to see ourselves as a collective. So the unity part of it, you won't be you won't have unity if you don't think you're you belong together. Mm -hmm. Community is the sense of belonging. It's the sense that you belong together, right? That's what yep. keeps you together in the first place. Um, Self-determination, when it comes to education, I can't think of a better principle for us. Stop blaming everybody else. If we're not doing every single thing we can for the intellectual development of young people, young black people, um, for instance, then we are not self-determining. We are not honoring our heritage. Our heritage is long, strong, and wide with examples of us self-teaching, self-educating, um, adults and stu uh, younger people together often at the same time through some of the worst circumstances. So in these bougie um, kind of situations we got going on now, there is no excuse. There's, no, there's not a single excuse in the world for a black child that can't read in 2020. In 2020, there is not an excuse that I can come up with where a black child in the United States, the wealthiest country on earth, would not be reading. That makes no sense to me, except for if you didn't have unity, collective action, self-determination, um, collective work and responsibility, cooperative economics, a purpose, creativity, and faith. Mm -hmm. That's the only excuse I could come up with <laughs> for a black child not reading in the United States. That's my final word. Yeah. What say you, Sharif El Meki? Man, yeah, like as you said, we did not uh, plan to initially talk about Nguza Saba, but I think you know the way that uh, we both approach this work um, in educational justice and racial justice um, and empowerment uh, and being in power. I think it, it you know it's balanced on these uh, these principles and and shout out to the 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 folks who you know like you know uh, my and the Thamusasa's teachers and founders like Nguza Saba wasn't just for Kwanzaa these were the principles these were our school principles our school values like you know we had these we memorized them um, and we they were applied and they were spoken about all the time like you know connecting the dots between actions and principles you know, uh, whether we were being recognized and rewarded or if we were being reminded of like, hey, you missed an opportunity, um, you know, to show faith in your in your peer and your in your uh, sibling or uh, a unified effort to support each other. Um, and so I, I think these these are principles daily for our community. Um, what I'm taking away from this and you've you, you know, you and I have spoken about this before, but I, I feel I'm particularly motivated to really create a portfolio um, and I think I need to really step my game up. You know, I, I feel like I mentor uh, people and I felt like I've always just uh, felt natural to it just felt natural. Part of my orientation to support people who who, uh, you know, were doing just good work, you know, whether it was a former student who's now a rapper. And, you know, if he mm. asked for support, you know, I, I, I you know. I, oh, absolutely. Or if it's uh, younger black educators or whatever, like, but I, I really like this idea of, of sponsorship because, you know, I was thinking about like, oh, the portfolio and sponsorship, I think is a very uh, distinct way that I can just step my game up, you know, um, in this in this space and in this field and being even more thoughtful, more deliberate um, about it. So I, I, I think I can do much, much more um, in that space. You know, I think about uh, Ayla again, Ayla Stanford, you know, she offered, you know, when she found out that my uh, oldest daughter was interested in the health field, she says, oh, you know, health, you know, come, 
come sit with me come watch me do surgery you know wow. uh, and like I'm, wow. you know and and but you know my daughter wasn't the first one my daughter is probably the 30th kid <laughs> that she mm -hmm. you know and so there's like when i think about her and her work not only outward facing the public but i know the the private conversations where she invited youth to come watch her perform surgery you know if they're interested and in just what that can do for um youth and to me that's you know that's higher levels of you know sponsorship in the portfolio of, of actually tracking you know and i would just uh end with that that uh that saying that african uh saying that you know the children the child who is not embraced by the village will burn it down to feel its warmth and so often Ooh. what we're I seeing always, that one feeling, always gets me yes yeah, say, man, it again. Like, say it again the child who is not embraced by the village will burn it down to feel its warmth Ooh. and it's that goes to the basic need of what you said of belongingness. Yeah. Like yeah. I need to feel belonging, right? Um, and you know, that's so deep. Yeah. So, um, well, I appreciate you, man. Listen to everybody listening and watching. You are a community. This is a family. This is mm -hmm. not a we talk and you listen situation. Read your comments. Love them. Any resources or whatnot that you have, please continue to drop them, drop in, them in. Yes. in the comments. Um, share this with others. We are going to be finding a way to build community outside of this show so that we can have more direct time with each other to talk all as a collective, as a group, as a family. Um, I will say this much uh, on today's topic. I think it's like one step towards reclaiming our youth, reclaiming our intellect, reclaiming what was ours and taking it back from a system that doesn't love our children and doesn't love uh, our people. One thing I would ask you about your po portfolio of young people that you are uh, actively trying to grow and, and make prosperous is what's your budget for your portfolio? Do you mm. have a budget to buy a ticket here or there for a person to attend this or that? Um, what is your time budget for it? Do you have time set aside in a lot of Do you maybe have a day a month where you can say to your employer on this day every month, the first Friday of every month, I will be bringing a young person with me to work. It's just a thing I want to do around shadowing. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. what's your time budget around it? What's your spiritual and, and um, um, uh, philosophical budget for it too? How much time and effort are you going to put into being able to think through deeply how you can take what you have and use it uh, in service of a younger person uh, superseding you, right? So like, what's your, your, cause um, you can have the money and you can have the time, but what's your philosophy around it? I have a philosophy that I've developed over time about how I help my portfolio of people. And do you have that too? So that's all that I would offer in terms of concrete. Dr. Cole always comes after me like with like, let's make sure that we give people something concrete and actionable to do. So those would be mine is to have a financial budget, a time budget and a philosophical um, budget for how you're going to handle your portfolio of young people who you're actively sponsoring to supersede you. Yeah. That's all I got, man. Hey, Thank you for watching. <laughs> I appreciate, uh, appreciate you all for watching and for participating. Uh, if you need to follow up with me in any way, shape, or form, you can shoot me an email at citizen at hey.com. That's H-E-Y dot com. It's the easiest way to, um, to interact with me or on Twitter at Citizen Stewart. If you want to reach uh, um, Sharif el Meki, it's Sel Meki on, um, uh, on YouTube, or I'm sorry, on Twitter. Uh, you can find him. Also, tell them about the center real quick, how they can find you at the center. Oh, yeah. Center Black Ed or is on Twitter and, and uh, Facebook. And the website is thecenterblacked.org, www.thecenterblacked.org. And I would say, as my favorite poet, Amir Suleiman, would say in one of his, um, one of his poems, tell me what you're going to do. No better yet, show me what you're going to mm. do. Show me. <laughs> it's like Missouri up in here, the show me state. Show me. Um, all right, y'all. Appreciate you all for.